Hello everybody and welcome to this first joint webinar on international real estate investments, co-hosted by CEPI, NIR and Opisos. I'm Boris Pizzolito, Opisos Sales Manager. And first of all, let me say thank you, really thank you to the speakers that will be with me today. Uh, first of all, Miss Elizabeth Rohr de Wolf, Secretary General of CEPI, which is the European Association of Real Estate Professions, Europe's major federation of real estate industry and professionals associations. Hi, Elizabeth. Put your mic on. Hi, everybody. Hi, Elizabeth. How are you again? <laughs> Thank you. Are you ready for the webinar? Yes, I am. Okay. Very ready. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. So let me now introduce also our friend from USA, Mr. George Schneider, Director of Global Strategy and Engagement of NIR, which is the National Association of Realtors in the US, the largest real estate professional association in the USA. Hi. Hi, Joe. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. How is going there? Are you in Chicago, Joe? I'm in Chicago, but I don't think it matters. I think we're all in our <laughs> own houses right now. So, yes, yeah. I'm in Chicago physically, but... This smart working makes it difficult to understand where the people are. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead. So, thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, Joe. Allow me to say just another word before we start on why OPISA speaks that this first joint, joint webinar is so important. OPISA is an international group founded in 2008 in order to propose real estate investment in the United States. And we are very glad and honored to participate and moderate this joint webinar as SEPI and NIR knowledge partner. Since we wish to help developing a bridge between US and European real estate markets and professionals. Um, like I said, Lopisa started its operations in 2008 when the subprime crisis created the first great opportunities for purchasing entire blocks of real estate in the US, also for international groups, not only for Americans, at an interesting, let's say, competitive price. From that, from that point, we developed a business model that included renovating and renting such properties in order to resell them to international investors as property investments with immediate and steady yields plus capital gain at resale. In 12 years, business has purchased and resold over 3,900 properties, those making its clients earn more than 295 million in rent yields. As for today, Opisus is operating with 18 offices in three continents with over 3,000 sales partners worldwide. So now we are facing a new historical moment for international real estate market. And as in 2008, Opisus is ready to take every opportunity generated from this situation. For this reason, it is my opinion that promoting events such as this joint webinar, which brings closer the two foremost professional realities on both shores of the Atlantic, could contribute to help real estate professionals finding guidance and opportunity, opportunities to evaluate what to do next. In fact, there are many opportunities on each shore of the Atlantic. And we think that dialogue, information, and communication are vital in order to catch them. Many Europeans and Americans are interested in willing to invest in foreign real estate for a lot of reasons. And for sure, they need an expert guidance. Such opportunities as these exist even right now, despite the health emergency which we are going to address more in detail during this web. To give you just a few anticipation, it is worth noting that in USA real estate prices still seems not to not be affected 
despite the temporary freezing of states. But Joe will talk about that better than me for sure. And that so far, there is no repercussions on residential rent fees. But let's go to the point. The webinar will be structured as a friendly interview with my friend Elizabeth and Joe. Uh, with me acting as moderator and addressing a series of related questions to our guests and friends here. The audience will be able to ask any related questions at the end of the interviews, please. So please share them with us only at the right time. Without any further ado, let us welcome again our two friends and start the first joint webinar. So Joe, let's start with you. Joe, would you like to briefly introduce NIR to our audience and explain what distinguishes it from other associations and makes its professionals stand out? In particular, could you please give us some highlights about NIR moral code and the application of MLS in the USA? Sure. Well, first off, thank you all for having me again. This is always a pleasure to speak to you all. Um, I really wish that we can be doing this in person and, and I'm really looking forward to the days where we can, you know, shake hands and hug each other and go back to the way things were. But for the in the meantime, I think this will have to work for us. So um, a little bit about NAR. Um, we are the, the world's largest trade association. We have 1.4 million members in the U.S. And our members practice all facets of real estate, whether you are a commercial agent, working with retail offices, industrial land, whatever it might be, or a residential agent, helping people navigate the home sales, home buying process. Um, we represent all 50 states, so we have an interesting structure in NAR, so we have three levels. NAR, the National Association of Realtors, is kind of the national arm. Then we have 50 state associations, which represent each state. And then under that, we have 1,100 local associations that represent every uh, major metropolitan area in the United States. And the reason why we do that in three specific tiers is because a major, major component of our association, just like you with CEPI, is advocacy. So we work very, very closely with our elected officials to ensure that if there's any legislation on their desk that impacts real estate, that we are educating them on the entire aspect of that specific bill or that specific law that they're looking at. Um, obviously, each level works at its, at its uh, respective government level. We work with the national government, um, states work with the state government, and then the local associations work with the local governments. Um, that is one of the big things. Another major facet of NAR is education. Um, we provide up to the minute education for all of our members, and it's something that we really pride ourselves on. Um, I'll talk about the code of ethics in a second. But education, we think, is one of the cornerstones of the association. Um, as we all on this call know, real estate is a constantly evolving industry with various trends, hence the trend, um, if you want to call it that right now with COVID-19. Uh, we're all trying to kind of learn how to best navigate this new situation we find ourselves in. So education is another major component. But I would say the number one thing that NAR hangs its hat on is what we call our code of ethics. So our code of ethics is a document that is now 112 years old. It was the founding document that started the association. And basically, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a living document that we change every single year based on practices we're seeing, uh, not just in the US, but all over the world. And really, this is the guiding document for all of our members. It's one, how to treat each other as professionals, how to treat your clients, and then how to treat the community. Um, it sounds like something that should be pretty self-evident, but surprisingly, I think as we all know in this industry, sometimes real estate agents behave badly. So what this document does is kind of create that, that framework for us all to follow. 
for us all to make sure that we're working in the best interests of the industry, because we all know one bad apple, one bad actor really spoils the entire industry and the name of all of the professionals. So that code of ethics is extremely important to us. Um, and then lastly, from a technical standpoint, one thing that NAR does, um, and you know, I see Pat David on this call, uh, is the MLS. And there's not a, a lot of associations around the world that have a true MLS. And the MLS has really allowed NAR to take that next step and then the step after that of helping democratize the real estate industry. And what I mean by that is giving everybody a fair chance to participate in the industry. Um, it gives more consumer competition to keep um, prices and commission rates fair for everybody so we can't so we don't run into this situation with people monopolizing the market. Um, and most importantly, it gives everybody the same access to data, which again, democratizes the industry and helps everybody kind of work on the same playing field. So advocacy, education, code of ethics, and MLS, I think are the four factors that really make NAR unique. Great, Joe, great to hear. Um... Why do you think so many foreign investors are attracted to U.S. residential real estate market? Um, well, I'll talk about this in a little bit, but you know, there it fluctuates. But I think the core principle that has remained constant throughout, you know, I would say the the entire history of the U.S. is that it's a safe investment. Um, one of our guiding principles, not just for real estate but for the entire country is a free market economy and private property rights. So um, when you purchase land here, this is your land 100% to, to do with as you wish. Um, you know, in, in some other countries, you know, you purchase land and the government could, seize is not the right word, but the government could come in and use the property for something that they might deem necessary and important. That doesn't happen here throughout unless there's an extensive legal process in which you're fairly compensated. So I think the security of investment in the US market is something that's always attracted people all over. Um, another major aspect I think for this crowd here is we're all in the real estate industry. We all look at real estate investment as a financial tool. So returns in the US are relatively stable and consistently stable. Um, yes, of course, they fluctuate. Um, you know, we saw that in 2008. I think we're gonna see that a little bit here in the next few months. But again, this is a, an extremely stable market as far as investment goes. Um, and it's always gonna be a safe, consistent bet. Great, great. Uh, Joe, according to your experience, what do U.S. citizens look for when considering a real estate investment in Europe in terms of unit, typology, price, and assistance? Well, that's a good question. Um, and it varies. I mean, it depends on which type of investor you are. If you are an individual looking for a vacation home, um, you know, we are going to look for things like that. But what we're seeing more from the institutional investment arm is Europe right now is seeing a huge, and as you all know on this call, um, student housing is a really attractive sector in Europe that a lot of our institutional investors are flocking to and putting uh, a great sum of money behind. So that's something that they're looking for. But um, for the same reasons we see people coming into the U.S., um, we see a lot of Asian buyers looking for uh, what we call educational investment. So places where their family can go to school in the U.S., close to universities, close to major cities, things like that. We're also seeing that go the other way for U.S. citizens that want to have their kids go to um, school in European universities. Now, of course, that's not kind of the underlying majority, but that's one of the things that we see and we're able to measure quickly. Um, and then we're always going to have kind of the vacation investor. So um, the vacation hotspots, the south of France, um, Italy, 
a lot of U.S. investors are attracted to those markets where they can, you know, take a vacation for two or three weeks out of the year. Great. So um, from an American perspective, how could cooperation between U.S. and European real estate professionals develop and improve interchange between these two huge markets and pools of clients? In your yeah. Opinion? So this is something, you know, for my role in particular, you know, I oversee the international arm of NAR. And what we're trying to do is really three things. So we're trying to, one, help our members and help our partners members connect and do more business with one another. The second goal is to help kind of expand that education that I spoke about earlier and to export that into other markets. And then the third um, and this doesn't really apply to the European market, but we see this more in Eastern Europe and a little more um, in Asia, Middle East, and Africa, but market development. So I talked about the MLS, so helping set the MLS up, helping set up licensing standards, things like that. Um, but I think the core underlying statement there is cooperation. And the more cooperation we have, um, whether that's events like this, whether that's formal exchange of information, whether that's property listings, property data, I think that more communication and more education is, you know, a kind of a stop all answer to kind of increase cooperation in any aspect, in any aspect, not just real estate, but in anything. Um, right now, I think what we're going to be seeing in the next few months is. You know, I won't go into that right now because I, I think that's the next question. But I think cooperation, more idea exchanges, more business exchanges is something that's really going to focus um, our efforts to improve the cooperation between the U.S. and European agents. I totally, totally agree with you, Joe. And as you know, business is trying to to help uh, a little bit to, to, to in, in this in this way. To, to develop because this cooperation for this reason uh, we are very very say very thank you to you and to, to NIR and to SEPI to promote this kind of events as this joint webinar and the joint report which uh, we published the last two years and regarding this please allow me to point out an interesting, in my opinion, figure from 2019 joint report. Apparently, 57% of American brokers who received the request for investing outside of the USA do not know towards who redirect their clients. That figure should, should highlight by itself the huge opportunities available for both Americans and Europeans and the extreme need of this collaboration and and education, as you say. Mm -hmm. um, Joe, according to both NIR data and your personal expertise, what are your insights about the current and possibly future situation of US real estate market and global markets with an eye for the possible consequences of the ongoing pandemic? So this is, Boris, we were talking about this a little bit before the call. Um, this is a fascinating question. Um, we are seeing an interesting thing and something that kind of defies common sense in a way. Um, and I say this in the most positive way possible. But um, right now, we, you know, in the U.S. using our MLS data, we pull uh, weekly and monthly reports on new listing activity in all of our markets around the country. And I think a really positive and uplifting fact and figure is that this time today, compared to where we were last year, we were only down 5% of new listings. 5% of new listings. And keep in mind that um, more than three quarters of the country is still in a almost complete or partial lockdown. So people are still finding a way to list their property. The market is still going on. Um, as far as price goes, we have not seen any price drops. Uh, Lawrence Yoon, our chief economist, does think we're going to drop a little bit, um, maybe less than 5%. 
which I don't think is a huge number considering everything that's going on. And um, so if that's from the US perspective, there's some really good things that are coming out. Again, it's a really early to tell because most of the country is still under a full or partial lockdown. Um, but from a global perspective, we're seeing some really positive things. So China, um, and again, take everything with the numbers that come out of China with a grain of salt. But in February, when they opened the country back up, their sales numbers were exactly at the same point that they were in December before the crisis really hit. So within a few weeks, the market bounced back almost to 100%. And that report came from Knight Frank, which is, as we all know, it's an international firm. So I tend to take those numbers um, at face value. So that's a really interesting um, factor there. And I'm hoping that what has followed in China um, and then what follows in China, I hope the rest of the world kind of follows. Um, I know the UK had just opened up their market last week, and I've been reading a lot of articles saying that there's a lot of pent up demand and that search activity is at a far, far greater number than it was before this. Now, there's a lot of factors that go into that. People just kind of being stuck at home and, you know, kind of dreaming about their next home. But I think there are some positive signs there. Of course, there's always risk factors and things that that do put up some red flags. But I think for all things considered, we are looking at a pretty positive turnaround here, um, which I'm hoping will kind of relay into the global markets. The one thing too, I think this is more of a personal um, prediction. I think international investment is gonna stop being so international, so to speak, and become a little more regional. So European investors are gonna look for more stable returns within European markets, maybe outside of their country, which would still make it international, but staying in the same region. I think US will start looking a little more um, south to Mexico and north to Canada. So again, I do think it will be a little more regionalized and focused in a smaller area as opposed to where it was before, where we are seeing, you know, practically a limitless ge geographical um, area of where investment was flowing from. So that's something I think is going to, you know, again, that's a personal prediction, but that's something I think we want to look out for. Great job. Your insights are always, always very, very interesting because you are inside the market and you know better than everyone how it's going there. So thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and just let me just give to all the, to the speakers and to the audience the apologizes of uh, Christian Caluza, our CEO and founder who really would like to participate to this webinar as a speaker, but he is uh, in a meeting right now and he, he cannot at the end, he is in a job meeting very important uh, outside uh, our office and he is not available, he cannot participate to, to, to the event right now and so he apologizes to everyone. Let's go ahead and uh, Elizabeth. Are you with us, Elizabeth? I am with you. Can you see me? Can you yeah, hear me? Hi. No, I see Hi. you. No, I see you, Elizabeth. How are you? Hello again. So let's do some, give uh, you some questions also to you. So, Elizabeth, would you please tell us more about SEPI and why its role uh, has proven to be crucial for European real estate professionals and associations? from so many different countries. Yes, so actually CEPI is an umbrella organization uh, that have, has approximately 25 countries. Um, I found out today, actually I, I, I kept it in my memory, but, uh, but today I saw that we are celebrating our 30th anniversary this year oh, in different constellations, but it, we were found in 1990 originally, and of course there were some changes in the past. And um, first of all, thank you very much for joining us as a knowledge partner. That's a very important thing for us. Uh, for CP. Um, 
And actually, so what we try to do is to collect the information from our, our country associations, because as you might know, uh, we are not representing um, the, the real estate agent and, and property managers themselves but we represent the associations of the different countries. And in total, uh, so uh, uh, Joseph was just mentioning the, uh, the, the incredible number of 1.4 million um, um, clients. So we do have approximately 350,000. And of course, for us, it's harder to collect all the important information as we have to deal with 25 different countries, and especially in the European Union and the, the European Commission, we do not have um, our parliamentarians or people whom we can talk to openly because there are much more changes and there is no special field which only um, takes care of real estate. Huh? So for us, um, it's quite hard to provide each of our countries with information what's going to happen in the future, because sometimes uh, we do not even know and uh, get surprised by what our politicians do. I think that's also one of the reasons why we love the cooperation with Joseph so much and with NER, because they can really teach us how to do proper lobbying, actually. As you know, um, we have, uh, at least we had two meetings a year uh, where we were able, I would say everybody whom I see here, met. I met already in the United States. Um, and um, so we can learn a lot from you, but we have totally different um, things we, um, we start from. Huh? Um, so what I can say is that we try to make it easy for people from uh, abroad, no matter which uh, from which continent or which country they come to provide them with the proper uh, information. But for us, it's also mainly GDPR, uh, what Joe mentioned, and also the code of ethics, which is one of our most important goals because you said one bad apple that also counts for us. Actually, we want all our members uh, to have the same um, code of ethics. And uh, this is something which is extremely important for us. And secondly, we do have the AML tool, uh, the anti-money laundering tool. So I was very happy to hear from Joe uh, that um, in this case, you would also like to learn from us in Europe because that works obviously in some countries better than uh, than in the United States. Um, well, yeah, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, given your privileged position as focal point of the European real estate framework and taking into account what our NIR guests just mentioned, such as MLS and Moral Code, what do you think would be a good idea for improving the work of European professionals? <laughs> to have a proper MLS, because actually you have, the, you have it for more than a hundred years, and what we figured out, I think in most of the countries within uh, Europe, that it's very hard to establish a real LMS if it has not been grown for decades. And I can only speak for, for Austria and Germany. So we are trying to establish a proper MLS, but it's very hard. And I, I think that counts for most of our, um, uh, our auditors. So maybe somebody else um, is willing to take over and tell something about a proper LMS M MLS because Unfortunately, we don't have it in the German-speaking countries. Okay, okay. I think that also in other countries in Europe, there uh, is this, the same, the same problem. And let's say it will be maybe a dream to have a European MLS, not only for all, but just single countries. It would be mm -hmm. a great, great goal for sure. Um, in your opinion, why should European professionals pay attention not just to their own market, but also to US residential real estate market? So, so can you please repeat the last sentence you said? Yes, I say, why should European professionals pay attention 
not just to their own market, but also to US residential real estate market. So I think it's a, it's a, first it, it's a global market and we do know about many people who would like to invest in the United States because there are of course many, many advantages. Um, as we know in, in most states you don't have such a strict rent control market for example like in, the, in, in, in many parts of Europe. And um, I think it's just an easier way of doing business. Sometimes it's also a, a particular thing such as the EB-5 program, for example, in Florida and in other states, which is very, very attractive. Um, and actually, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's an easier market than in, in many European countries and it's easier to purchase something especially what you are doing, the, 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 the apartments which have been rented already, that you get a return on your investment. This is something which is more complicated the other way around because, because of the rent controlled market that we do have in most countries in Europe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what advice would you give to a US professional willing to better understand and operate in the framework of European real estate? First of all, to talk to you, of course, <laughs> because you have the, the, the full screen, the overview, how it works. And of course, it's, it's very important that we have NAR as a partner because it happens quite often that there are questions which cannot be answered by uh, European real estate agents because the, the law is different in each state. That also counts, of course, for the United States, but still, I mean, there's one person or one organization you can attract um, and, and find out more about it. And it's also the other way around, of course, although our laws are totally different in each country, and it's also, um, you'd also have uh, difficulties, more or less difficulties to step into certain markets. CPI uh, can pr provide you with a great overview about what's going on in, in which country. Huh? So we collected those data. Um, for us, it's maybe not that easy to provide you with figures such as um, there are 5% less uh, listings or 5% more listings because this we cannot count that easily. And most countries do have a, a public register uh, where you can see how many uh, sales we had. but that will take another couple of weeks until we get valid figures. Yes, if I can say from the perspective of a US professional um, that wants to, to address his investors to European markets and it's important for them that there is an organization like SEPI uh, that to whom to, 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 to talk to whom to talk, because uh, Europe, it's, it's not like United States, so it's not a, a union of states, but there are different states, different laws, and so to have an, an umbrella organization where to collect the information, uh, receive the information from each country and to get in touch through SEPI to the uh, association of the single country I think it's very important also for uh, foreign international professionals and for US, US professionals. And uh, may I add something? Because there is this uh, cross-border um, project of the European Commission actually that you can do uh, uh, cross-border um, sales. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is something CP uh, is also um, Actually, we are trying very hard to establish that in the in the heads of uh, of all the people working in the real estate industry. Uh, but um, so far, it did not work out that well, uh, just because of the different uh, systems in all different countries. And this is why CIP is so important that they collect the information and they can tell you for each country what is necessary if you want to deal in this very special field. I think with this information it's very interesting and as a piece of and I think also with this kind of events, uh, joint webinar, maybe in the future we can talk more about this 
cross-border sales opportunities. And uh, okay, so great, thank you, Elizabeth. And um, it was extremely interesting. And um, I will say that we have still a couple of minutes, and so we can do a short Q and A. If there are there are there any question from the audience, we are here, me and Elizabeth and Joe to answer to your question, or if Joe wants to make a question to Elizabeth or Elizabeth to Joe, you are, it will be more than appreciated. Uh, not so much a question, but just a statement to what Elizabeth had said. And, um, you know, in setting up a European MLS, I think it's extremely, extremely challenging. Um, we built ours in accordance with, you know, ours is 100 years old. And when we built the MLS, the real estate industry was kind of all over the place. So we use the MLS as a way to kind of organize the business. Now with European markets, I mean, you guys have been selling real estate longer than we've been a country. So you guys have your markets established. You understand all of the idiosyncrasies of that. So it's harder to develop an MLS to bring it in and build it on top of an already established system and to implement these new rules, which now every agent has to follow. So, you know, with an MLS, we've seen it successfully implemented in other countries, um, but I would say, test it out. You know, you do not need to set up an MLS by the rule book, by, you know, you follow step A, follow step B, follow step C, but you can do it to fit your market in a way where you can more efficiently share properties more efficiently collect back end sales data and things like that. Um, so, you know, it, it's always interesting because it's so, so tough to get those set up. And we're seeing it more successfully implemented in those markets that are uh, in, in developing countries that need some more organization. But, you know, I, I don't think it's a, um, a negative thing that Europe does not have an MLS. I just think that your market is established in a way that would make it tough to bring in a new kind of governing system to to run it. So uh, th I just wanted to chime in on that. Really interesting. Elizabeth, what do you think yes, about? I, I had a totally different question, uh, which um, actually I'm personally interested in knowing because if you read all the, the European newspapers, huh, then you can, uh, there is a fight going on between the US and the Chinese market and uh, the politicians actually. So maybe you don't see it that way. So for, for us, uh, no matter which uh, newspaper you open, uh, and this is something, um, I, I'm just wondering how you see it the other way around. How does the United States see Europe? Uh, for the time being and uh, and conflicts there might be at, because i think at the moment there might be some people who say uh, okay i rather wait before i invest in the united states because that does not sound too good i think everybody around the world right now i mean it's you know if they have cash they're sitting on it you know i don't know how long they're going to remain liquid but um, I think people are just kind of waiting to see what shakes out. Um, you know, like I said, the statistics that we've seen so far have been promising is not a huge downturn, which some people initially thought in the very beginning of this pandemic. So I think that people are really just kind of holding and waiting. Um, you know, a real estate invest investor is a real estate investor. You know, they're going to look for what their goals are, whether that's returns, whether that's stability, whatever they're trying to accomplish, they know where to find it and they know how to invest in markets all around the world. So I think they're right now looking for the opportunity. And I think by the end of the year, hopefully there's not a second wave of this COVID-19 kind of uh, flare up, but I think people really want to wait and make sure that a market that they put their money into has come out of the other side of this COVID-19 crisis on a positive note and up on the up and up. So I don't, I think international investment this year will really slow down for that reason. Um, 
and I think into the second half of next year as well, until there are more clear paths to invest money in, and not just in Europe, but all over the place, so. Great. Is there any other question from the audience? I can just so look I was uh, I wanted uh, to add something it's it's also of course at the moment a little bit difficult if you have a property overseas and you don't know when you can fly there again and and have your vacation such as in in Florida or whatever so of course this is also at the moment something that truly bothers us because we do not even know when we can go to Italy and we have no idea um whether we can go to the united states within um the next couple of weeks huh? yeah i mean you know everyone on this call are seasoned real estate professionals we all travel extensively for these roles and i mean just look at how our pace has slowed down and these are for business reasons um i couldn't imagine le imagine leisure travel getting anywhere you know to a point where people can go visit their second homes or go on vacation anywhere so and again that goes to my point is you know is and i think that's going to have long-term effects on tourism industries and tourism hotspots in the u.s so but is that going to have such a big impact that it's going to sink a local economy thus sinking the real estate markets in those places so it's something that, again, the savvy investor is kind of holding on to their money and I think waiting to see where what develops in which markets around the world. So it's gonna be interesting, but so far I think the, the key factors that we all look at for the health of a real estate market have been fairly positive and I'm hoping they stay that way. Okay, I have just... Yeah. Um, please, please, Elizabeth, after I have yes. this question. So, and one question to you uh, and Opisa. So, actually, because your special market and field are um, rented apartments within the US, uh, so do you have any figures uh, for any loss of, of income uh, due to the fact that people uh, lost their jobs or anything like this? Uh, yes, yeah. so the figures that we have right now is that there is, there is no any difference uh, on the rental. So what is happening is, let's say, Opisus is investing in a kind of property that are the average residential properties for, let's say, the average American. So it's a, a really a niche market. In this niche market, in some location and in some uh, typology of properties, also more than the 80% or 90% of the residents are on rental basis. So they are not the owner, but they are on rental basis. That means that happens what happens, they will need always a roof uh, on their head. So what is happening right now that we are not watching of many difficult on um, payment of rental nothing different between, between, between the average they say um, because people first of all want to pay the rent because they need their home their house okay this niche market I'm talking about that and also because the state government and even more the federal government first of all uh, give uh, some money to these people so with the um, uh, people that lost their jobs so they have these uh, payments and other financial aid really really concrete financial aid to to the let's say the average american so this is what happened in what is happening with the opisas kind of properties i cannot talk for all the u.s market because it's huge and very very big market and Joe knows much better than me how it's working that but let's say it's about 33.3 trillions of dollars of value the residential market in the US that means that it's very very huge and inside that ocean of houses and residential properties there is everything so let's say in our niche market is going like that 
And I have just uh, a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, two for you, Joe. I have the, a question that I'm trying to do to you every time that we met, but you are you are trying not to answer. Which is uh, which? U.S. locations are the hottest real estate market right now, in your opinion. Well, I'll dance around this question as well because we represent all markets. But um, I think again, it depends on what you're looking for. Um, you know, the the coast, the New Yorks, the Floridas, the San Francisco, Seattle, Los Angeles are going to be um, obviously your most expensive markets. Those are going to be. Um, where you're going to see kind of the most long term appreciation. But if you're looking for more of a short term investment, we're starting to see our, our second tier or tertiary markets, which is more of the central US, the Midwest. So um, Chicago, where I live, the Kansas cities, the uh, a lot of Texas markets are starting to become more um, attractive international investment hotspots because you can get in for lower prices, you know, from a residential perspective. The home prices are still um, relatively cheap compared to the coast, the east and west coast, and they still yield high rents. So um, in terms of that, I mean, I think you're probably looking at some of those Midwest markets as a starting point to get in. Um, but again, it really depends on what you're looking for. If you're a uh, more of a commercial developer looking for um, industry or office or whatever it might be the coast is has a majority of kind of the jobs that are created in the u.s so it's all really depending on what you're looking for but if you're looking for more of a residential investment to create cash flow um the midwest is probably your best bet right now great job great job thank you for your answer i know that it's tough for you to answer to these kind of questions but you know, this time it wasn't me, it was the audience, okay? <laughs> so another question for you, Joe, uh, you already talked about that, but from our Facebook uh, audience, so I think that maybe he is a client, and he's asking what difference does such uh, ethical code, so the NIR ethical code make for uh, clients? The mic, sorry, Joe, the mic. Sorry, my apologies. Um, it's a big difference. So, you know, we have 1.4 million members here in the US. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that every single member is the most ethical person that you would wanna deal with in the US. Um, I think from a numbers perspective, that's just impossible to do. Um, but what the Code of Ethics allows is not only is it an upfront kind of um moral contract that you as a professional are participating in but there's also a full back-end system that allows you to really take action if you if something happens that goes against that code so what we have is we have what we call grievance committees um, within our local associations and if there was an incident that um you know, I was not happy about it. I feel like I was wronged as a consumer. I can file a complaint with that local association and then an independent um, committee, I won't call it a tribun tribunal, but an independent committee will then evaluate the situation. They'll hear both sides of the story. And then this committee actually has the power to um, impose financial fines on the, on the individual that committed these things. So. From a consumer perspective, it gives you recourse um, for anything that's wronged against you. And that also goes for professionals. So if you're working with another agent in a transaction, and something happens which causes you money due to the other person's fault, then that is a, you also have a area for recourse as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joe. I have a question also for Elizabeth. I think that also this one, it will be not so an easy question, but 
please try to 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 answer to it uh, um, from our social media audience so it's asking what are in sepi opinion the major effects that COVID-19 is having to European real estate industry? Well, I would say the hardest fact was, of course, at the moment, like in the US, that you were not capable uh, to make viewings because it was simply forbidden. And most people, unless you purchase something in the United States from Opisas, which is a rented out place that you do not even have to see. People want to see what they buy. Huh? And we also uh, saw that all the, the authorities were closed. So if you would like to know more about the property and the owner cannot provide you with this, you, did, you had no chance to go to the authorities. That slowed down the market, of course. And um, But I would rather say that more and more people are interested in uh, uh, purchasing real estate because they have the fear that there might be an inflation maybe small inflation uh, and that you rather buy something that you can either rent or out or use by yourself so i think it has a positive impact although it's such if um, an awful story yeah yes uh, if i can say from a business perspective what we are watching in this month, this last two months, is that a lot of, uh, let's say, financial way, in way of investors, that maybe they exit from the stock exchange market in the last month, and as also Joe said, they have quite a lot of cash, and they are seated on this cash, and they are watching on uh, diversifying their investment and usually we say nothing is much more real than the real estate so it's a good opportunity to diversify your investment in the also in this month especially I say in this month because at the end you are buying something real concrete okay and so um, what as a piece of we are seeing that that a lot of investor with this uh, financial approach is are uh, coming to us and to other uh, professionals to try to do this kind of investment in Europe or in the in the US. Okay, if there is any if there is any other uh, question. Okay, so great. I think we are done. <clears throat> Again, thank you very much to Miss Elizabeth Rohr Wolf, Secretary General of SEPI, the European Association of Real Estate Professions, and to Mr. Joe Schneider, Director of Global Strategy and Engagement of NIR, the National Association of Realtors <coughs> of the United States. Um, I bring again the apologize of Mr. Christian Calusa, our CEO and founder of PISA, who uh, cannot participate to this meeting for uh, job uh, instances, as uh, for a delay in a job uh, in a job meeting. And also for sure, thanks to everyone for participating to this first joint webinar. For those in the audience who may have other questions or are interested in cooperating with the PISAS, please feel free to check our website and contact us. We are always at your complete disposal. So, thank you again, Elizabeth. Thank you. Cho, are we going to see you in, in November? Is the NAR a real this conference going on? You guys love putting me on the spot today. Uh, <laughs> uh, right now, the answer is yes. Um, there are a lot of moving pieces. So the as we sit today, right now, we are still doing an in-person conference in New Orleans. Um, however, we just had our legislative meetings two weeks ago, which is our, one of our biannual meetings, and it was all online. 
So we had a, a tremendous turnout for that, a record setting number. So we do think that we're gonna be doing a hybrid. So in-person and a virtual uh, conference so we can reach more people. So um, right now, yes, it's still in, in planned to move forward, but there's a lot of moving parts and things are very fluid at this, at this time. So I, I will say, hope to see you all of you in in US for the NIR convention in November. Or if not, we will do it in a virtual way. So thank you so much, Joe, for participating in this webinar. And goodbye to all of you and stay tuned for the next joint knowledge initiative. Bye bye to all of you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Bye.